peace before us, peace behind us, peace under our feet, peace within us, peace over us, let all around us be So good morning. See, the sun comes out on Good Friday. The weather is a great teacher. Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. It's five-year mission to explore strange new worlds to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. That's one side of it. After he entrusted his mother uh, to his beloved disciple who was standing at the foot of the cross, St. John tells us Jesus knew that everything had been completed. And he then was given a small bit of consolation as he was um, when he said, I am thirsty. And a jar full of sour wine stood there. So putting a sponge soaked in the wine on a hyssop stick, they held it up to his mouth. After Jesus had taken the wine, he said, it is fulfilled. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. So, today we are asked to reflect and to witness and to open ourselves to the reality behind it, not as only as observers, but as participants to the uh, meaning of death. So, at the, in the Last Supper, as we saw, there, we have to confront this dark and painful aspect of life we call betrayal. And in a sense, death is a betrayal as well. It betrays our hopes and it betrays our sort of hidden expectation that we will carry on forever. And the way we handle betrayal and the way we handle death make all the difference to the way we live, to our experience of life in, as this adventure, as this exploration, as this passing beyond uh, all frontiers, to boldly go where we have not gone, be gone before. The death of Jesus is a very important moment in the Gospel story and the Gospels uh, tend to give a disproportionate amount of time to describing the, uh, 
what led up to his death and his dying and, and his, final, uh, his final death. There is often a great concentration of experience and presence and meaning in those final moments of life. And a great deal of healing can happen with a family, uh, with friends, uh, around a deathbed. But uh, in the way Jesus died, we see him virtually abandoned. Only John shows, uh, well, the Gospels say the women followed him. Uh, and only, the, only John shows specifically John the Beloved and Mary, his mother, standing at the foot of the cross. There's a, a line uh, in Macbeth, at the beginning of Macbeth, when it describes um, the death of, uh, uh, um, of a character called Cawdor. Nothing in his life became him like his leaving it. Nothing became his, nothing in his life became him was, was, more suit, more, was more expressive of who he really was than the way he died. And in the great wisdom traditions, uh, the way we die, the art of a good death, is essential to the way we are meant to live and life in its values and in its virtues and in the decisions we make and how we live can be seen as a preparation for death. That death wasn't something that was denied, swept under the carpet, fantasized uh, away, but it was something that was, we knew was coming. Of course, it came at a, a much earlier age than it does for us on the whole. And, uh, and so perhaps that frontier of death uh, was, was more immediate and more pressing and more unpredictable. Uh, than it is for us. So perhaps for that reason, in traditional cultures, uh, the way we lived was, was seen as a preparation for death, and dying well, having a good death, was seen as uh, one of the goals of life. Something that's difficult for us to understand in a society which has secularized death uh, so much, of course. Um, I think something like 90% of people, if they fill out a questionnaire, would say that they would like to die at home, you know, with their family and friends around them. But actually, 80% uh, of us die in hospitals. And the secularization of death, the sort of medicalization of death, um, which is driven very often by the medical interventions to prolong life at any, at any cost, and death itself is seen as a failure, a medical failure. And, I mean, there is a, a reaction against that, it has been for a long time, in the palliative care movement, in the hospice movement, which uh, brings medical skill and expertise and technology uh, to help us die well and to die um, as free from pain as possible and to die with dignity, um, but to, to accept and pass through this experience of death that all the great wisdom traditions have given great spiritual importance to and which do not see death as the final frontier in a sense, but see death as opening us to space and to this not five-year mission but to this eternal expansion uh, into the reality of life itself. So I think today we, um, we can take a, a little extra time in this afternoon will, should be I think a quiet time uh, for us after the, uh, uh, the liturgy of the cross in the church at three o'clock. Uh, but we should take some quiet time uh, 
to reflect upon our own understanding uh, of death, our own attitude to death. If we do that, we will probably, uh, depending on our age and, and condition of health, but we will probably think first of all about the losses we've had, those close to us, uh, those we have loved, those in whom our, with whom our lives were intertwined, uh, who have died. And that may be a good place to start as we, as we prepare to enter into Holy Saturday and then the celebration uh, of, the, of the resurrection. Do we feel more or less separated from those whom we have loved and who have died? And if we could say that in some strange way we feel even closer to them or we feel that they have not um, disappeared from our lives, maybe we have the beginning of an understanding or an experience of the resurrection. And then, as I say, depending on where we're coming from, it would be good for us to reflect upon our own mortality. Um, sometimes we have to push ourselves to do that, and that's why all, especially the, the, the great monastic traditions of the world, have always made this a, a particular exercise, a particular um, practice to reflect on our own mortality, even if we have to sort of rub our nose in it a little bit and make a special effort, because we do, of course, tend to push it aside. And we think maybe that's the more healthy thing to do, is not to dwell on our mortality. But actually, the, the great wisdom traditions, like St. Benedict, tell us to keep death constantly before our eyes, memento mori, to remember our mortality. Because this is actually the way of keeping life in focus and enjoying the, uh, the gift of life and the, the, the meaning of life as it um, unfolds for us. Um, and we should reflect, I think, today in the light of uh, the description of, of the cross and Jesus dying with that sense of fulfillment, of accomplishment, of completion, consummatum est, of cons consum consummation, um, we should uh, reflect on what we would like our own death to be, how we would like to be when we die. <coughs> My good friend, uh, Dr. Balfour Mount in Canada, who founded the palliative care movement there many years ago and has cared for the dying and uh, set up the palliative care movement, uh, says that we should die healed, we should die healthy, we should die well, and we can. Uh, and he says that um, research uh, shows that uh, m most people whose basic uh, psychological and physical needs are being met and whose pain is under control um, and who have a sense of meaning, we'll come back to this, but have a sense of meaning in their lives, will say they have never felt better. They have, their quality of life is as good as it has ever been. I mean, nothing shows more clearly that happiness does not depend upon our material circumstances. We think that what will make us happy is a long life or endless life and prosperity and uh, you know, all the boxes in our conception of happiness are ticked. But uh, the reality doesn't seem to be like that. And uh, even in this survey that was done uh, of people who were approaching death and who were uh, commenting upon their experience of the quality of life, there were many who said uh, that they had um, never experienced life so 
in such a fulfilled way and such a with such good quality and something like 25 percent of those died before the research uh, project was ended. So as soon as we begin to, to focus, it's difficult for us to focus on betrayal, for example, and yet betrayal can tell us something extremely uh, transformative and valuable about how we are to live. That the acceptance of betrayal uh, uh, introduces us to the meaning of love and to the meaning of forgiveness and to a transformation of our cycle of violence with which we, um, with which we tend to uh, respond to, uh, to betrayal or disappointment or conflict. So in the same way, facing the reality of uh, death, which is a very obvious part of life as well, um, can help us to understand the meaning of happiness and the meaning uh, of our existence. Good Friday, then, brings together some very essential human uh, issues. That pioneering hope and adventurous spirit of the Star Trek uh, crew as they go week by week <laughs> out into, uh, into space, discovering uh, new life and new civilizations. That sense of, I mean, this is pure American optimism. Life can only get better, and it should get better, and it, it, and it can get better. Um, the limitation of the Star Trek optimism is that it, it, it doesn't, uh, and perhaps it wouldn't have been so popular if it did, it doesn't uh, integrate this other uh, reality of life, which is the experience and understanding of the meaning of death. So, in a way, today, uh, the theme, the liturgy, this part of the story that we're going through uh, comes together in the idea of hope. And John Main speaks about this in a chapter of his book, Door to Silence. I thought we might just listen to this because it gives us a key to understanding what the cross, why the cross, why this death should be such a universal and transforming symbol of hope. Um, and John Main describes this, I think reveals this, by his comments on how in meditation we are able to go beyond desire as we let go of our hopes. So he says, if you've been meditating long enough, you know from your own experience, a key phrase in John Main's vocabulary, in your own experience, he wanted people to have this in their own experience. You come to know that practice teaches us to meditate without expectations. We learn that the road we are treading is the way of dispossession. So spiritually speaking, this is the, this is the, um, the, the, the mission. This is the uh, expedition. This is the adventure uh, <coughs> to go beyond, uh, is, uh, to follow this way of dispossession. We even let go of our desire for wisdom, for knowledge, for holiness, for God. Once we enter the experience of pure prayer in meditation, meditation was called pure prayer by the early teachers, we understand the limitation of praying for things, for passing concerns. So normally we, we uh, think of prayer at an early stage in our understanding of prayer. We, we, we see it in terms of 
getting what we want. And we have this connection or this uh, technique or this uh, way of, of getting what we want, fulfilling our own desires by appealing to the higher power, to, the, to God. And although we know that these concerns and needs that we have are known to God, Jesus says, your Father knows your needs before you ask, and we can pray for them, and we can articulate them and put them into words or conceptualize them very validly. It's a way of prayer. But uh, the longer we meditate, I think the less emphasis we give to that kind of petitionary prayer, asking this higher power to fulfill, you know, to send good weather, to uh, help us win the lottery, to even to um, cure our cancer or whatever it is. But increasingly, he says, we are overwhelmed by the sheer wonder of the experience of prayer itself. So we're back to the starship. The wonder of entering into the limitless of Christ's prayer. This is his theology, but it's also his experience in faith that when we pray in this prayer of the heart, in pure prayer, in meditation, we are entering, we are, as it were, transcending or moving beyond our, anything we can call mine. Once we begin to detach from the ego, uh, what can we say is mine? Because it's only the ego that says mine or even me, for that matter. So as we weaken the gravitational pull of the ego, we find that we become more detached. And we begin to see things in themselves as they really are, and life as it really is, rather than as we project it or imagine it, or desire it to be. And this, uh, I think if we build meditation quietly, gently, regularly into our life, this process happens, uh, but it's not violent, it's not uh, hurtful. It's actually a sense of an adventure, it's a sense of liberation. But it is real change. As the ego diminishes, and we cannot even say that it's my meditation, Obviously, we have to make time for it, we have to put our work into it, and so on, but, uh, but we don't possess it in that way. So increasingly, we are overwhelmed by the sheer wonder of the experience of prayer itself, the wonder of entering into the limitlessness of Christ's prayer, of entering the uncharted, unchartable seas of the divine reality, the oceans, the seas of the divine reality to describe which there are no words. Well, here is a, here's a, a spiritual understanding of the, of the Starship uh, project. To, uh, so he's saying that as we enter into this experience of pure prayer, we, and as we transcend the limitations, the frontiers of our own egoism, we uh, pass beyond desire, because desire is always my desire. We pass beyond all desire, but then he adds, but this is not to pass beyond hope. Now, we sort of fear losing desire because we think we would just be sort of an empty rag or a limp rag or something, that without desire we wouldn't have, uh, we wouldn't have the, uh, the gears to engage uh, with, with life. But to pass beyond desire, he says, is not uh, to pass beyond hope. Christian hope is at the very heart of our commitment to the practice of meditation. Now remember, he sees meditation in Christocentric terms, 
as our way of entering in, each time we meditate, into the Paschal mystery, into the dying and the rising of Christ. So we actually, in our own experience, enter in... Could you, could you just ask them to be quiet in there? Uh, to... Um, sorry. We enter through our own experience uh, into death, into dying and resurrection. The dying is a passing beyond the, uh, the orbit or the gravitational pull, very strong, very insistent, of our ego. Uh, but to detach ourselves from that, and it is to expand, that is the resurrection, to see our life expanding beyond all known frontiers. And that is exactly what, why we see changes taking place in us and in our life and relationships uh, as we meditate day by day. We are actually entering into this mystery of death and resurrection. Christian hope is at the very heart of our commitment to the practice of meditation. And it's this quality, this virtue, this theological virtue of hope, which gives us the, the fuel, as it were, to keep the spaceship going. Uh, it's the fuel that motivates us to persevere. Because otherwise we would easily give up uh, when we run into some asteroids or when we discover some aliens who are not friendly to us. And therefore, he says, it is useful to understand the difference between hopes and hope. Fundamental new way of evaluating our plans and our uh, sense of purpose in life. He says, hopes are always limited. We hope for this or for that. They're short term, relatively short term. But hope itself, he says, is the realization of the infinite. So it is to pass beyond the gravitational pull of the ego and its limitations to pass beyond the, the desires and the images associated with those desires. That's why when we meditate, we let go of thoughts and Im images. Uh, behind the, th the thoughts, if we have clear thoughts, which we rarely do, but uh, behind the thoughts there is always uh, an image, there is an imagination, there is a fantasy. So to let go even of the images that come up, which carry the energy or the traces uh, of the ego, that is, that is pure prayer, that is the, 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 the letting go that uh, projects us into the infinite, the boundless. The, the so, um, in order, he says, to enter into full Christian hope, we must abandon all hopes, because these hopes these limited, time-specific, short-term hopes uh, are our desires. Desires are everything that comes under the heading of wanting. By comparison with being concerned with our hopes, our short-term desires or wants, he says, hope itself is a kind of bliss. It's an intoxication, in a sense, that was what the, the mystics like Gregory of Nyssa called a sober intoxication. It's that, uh, for example, that sense of wonder that the astronauts uh, report feeling when they look out of their little porthole and see uh, the universe. It's what we kind of rather voyeuristically saw in, in films like, uh, what's it called, Gravity. So hope is a kind of bliss. It is the bliss arising from the supreme confidence that fills the experience of prayer. 
Uh, paradoxically, it's this confidence that we see in the words of Jesus, I think, on the cross. It is fulfilled, it is accomplished. Um, he doesn't give an explanation of that, but these words are enough to express the discovery, uh, and, and after all, death is the transcendence of the ego, the physical death, which transcends the ego, because the ego is always going to be around to some degree, uh, as long as we are in a physical body and subjected to the physical desires and the physical circumference of our body. <coughs> Obviously we need that uh, in order to develop our consciousness and to make our first discoveries about the meaning of existence. But uh, as long as we are limited by our physical body, we are, um, we are to some degree limited by the ego itself. But in hope, which is the transcendence of desire, and therefore the transcendence of the ego, our potential is at once realized and extended. Hope arises from knowing that there is a way, a sure way, maybe a hard way, may be demanding, but certain. This is the confidence. And this is actually a rather, the rather strange paradoxical experience that you may have had when you are with someone who is dying well, who has a good death. Uh, and even though there is the pain of separation, and that pain is real, it's, it's uh, inevitable if you love that person. Nevertheless, at the same time, you can have this sense of confidence or certainty that it is okay, that it is right. So it can paradoxically, very contradict in a very contradictory way, it can be both excruciatingly painful and amazingly wonderful or joyful even. And one does not actually diminish the other. In fact, even the, 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 the sense of wonder, the sense of confidence and certainty that you can have when somebody is dying well uh, may even increase your pain and sense of uh, the feeling of separation. Um, but they, they don't negate each other, they are... And that's one of the paradoxes, of course, that we are uh, asked to reflect on in, uh, as we contemplate the cross uh, today. <coughs> the hope growing in our heart, John Main says, as we meditate day by day, is, this, is the certainty that Christ is the way. He is the way to eternal life, to limitless life, life without beginning or end. The way we are on, so this is how the early Christians understood the meaning of Christ in their lives, that he was the way. And although this may be misinterpreted as an exclusive statement, it, in, in discovering it, uh, we experience it as an expansive um, statement, an inclusive statement. Anyway, the way we are on, Jesus is the way, the way we are on takes us to a life that is always in a state of expansion. The knowledge we discover in the silence, now silence is that condition we enter into as we lay aside our thoughts excuse me, our thoughts and our desires. That's when silence happens. Silence grows, silence deepens as the mind uh, just quietly, routinely, faithfully lets go of the thoughts and the imagination that it is constantly uh, 
producing. It's a factory of images, uh, working 24-7. So meditation is not about blanking out the mind, but it is about transferring our attention away from this flow, this endless flow of thought and imagination, which has, a, has some very good aspects to it. But in meditation, we, we enter into the silence, which Meister Eckhart says is as close to God as you can get. There is nothing so much like God as silence. And we enter into the silence to the degree that we can simply, humbly, and of course imperfectly, uh, most of the time, leave aside our thoughts and imagination. The knowledge we discover in the silence is that he who is true is the way. This is not something that can be discovered in any book or any lecture or any discussion. It is only be to be discovered in silence, the poverty and humility of silence. Well, when we come to venerate the cross today, if you wish to, um, that is precisely what we are acknowledging. We are, no one is forcing us to, to venerate the cross. And it's not uh, about renewing your membership uh, subscription. But as we come up to venerate the cross, we are acknowledging and confessing, in that sense, uh, opening ourselves to something we cannot really understand, but it's there for us to, to enter into, and that is the, the poverty, the dispossession, the letting go, and the humility of the silence that is the cross. So the cross is a great symbol of silence. Now, when we look at the cross and some crucifixes kind of, as it were, push this in your face very strongly, um, we're often, we often feel that the, the, the meaning of the cross is the suffering that it displays. You know, the agonizing death of being crucified with nails in your feet and hands and not being able to breathe as you hanging on the cross and, you know, the, the blood draining out of you. So that can be very graphically and clearly that was what it was like. It was a common form of execution. The, um, uh, the emperors used to, you know, crucify thousands of people along the Via Cassia, was it the Via Cassia or the Via Appia? Anyway, after the uh, slave revolt, uh, revolt. So it was a fairly degrading and ordinary uh, uh, kind of, of death and excruciatingly painful and, um, and shameful because if you were a citizen, you had the honor of having your head cut off. You'd be just be beheaded, like uh, you know the, the, the royalty or something. But uh, so the cross is is not only painful; it is also uh, an illustration of just how much on the margins or beyond the pale uh, Jesus is, and it's precisely that which brings him to the centre. Of, uh, of humanity, his very exclusion, marginality, and so on. So we can look at the cross, and we should reflect on this aspect, the social and psychological and physical aspect of the cross. These are, this reminds us that the body uh, is, at, is at play here. This is a physical, not just a theological thing that we are reflecting on. And that can, of course, help us to connect to its meaning. However, it is not the suffering of the cross itself that is the essential meaning of it. So what is the meaning? Well, I think the meaning, uh, we can approach the meaning better through our understanding of where meditation is taking us, of what 
hope, or what is the difference between hope and, and hopes, and what the, 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 the real human adventure, the real human exploration of space and time, the universe of creation of our own being, uh, is to go beyond the gravitational pull of our own ego, to break out of that. Now, to break out of that, of course, you've got to have a great deal of uh, energy. Just look at a spaceship taking off. And where does that energy come from to boost us out of the orbit uh, of our own, our own ego? Um, so, um, so just as we uh, are concerned today about living well, about the art of living, we should also uh, reflect on the ancient wisdom that we cannot develop the art of living without incorporating the art of dying, the ars moriendi. And to understand the art of dying, we perhaps need to understand, as we do more clearly perhaps now than ever, the psychological stages that we pass through uh, in grief and in, in dying. These have been very, I think, convincingly articulated as, as these stages. There is the first stage when you get bad news, what do we say? Oh no. <laughs> you know. And your first instinct is to put out your finger and press the rewind button. You know, we could just turn the clock back. We could slip into some time machine or fold space and time together and go back and, and then try it again. So there is this first reaction of denial and isolation where we block. This is, this is an attempt, perhaps, of, above all, to block the first wave of pain that hits us as we face uh, our, our death or a loss. Do we see that in Jesus? Hmm? Yes, does he deny it? But wouldn't that have been the moment where he could have denied it? Where we, where we would deny it? And he knew it was coming. And, uh, you know, he said, not my, I, don't want to do, I don't want to go through this. But that's not the same as denying its reality. Okay, the second is anger. Okay, you can't deny it anymore because it's uh, on top of you. But uh, you hit out in all directions. You blame your doctor, you blame, I don't know, uh, yourself, you blame, uh, you blame other people first. Uh, we, we, we hit out in anger even against the people who are there to help us. Does Jesus show that anger? No. When, when could he have done that? Yes, Last Supper, Pontius Pilate, yeah, in, in Gethsemane, and the disciple, he was a little bit irritated by the disciples falling asleep, uh, but he didn't get angry with them as such. Okay, um, so what about bargaining is the third stage, where you, um, of course, you, you then, the, the mind begins to produce these hopes, these deals, these ways of negotiation. You start to bargain with, with God or with some higher power. Does Jesus do that? A little bit in Gethsemane. Hmm? A little bit in Gethsemane. I think when he prayed, if this if it, if it could pass. Hmm. But, what does he say? If it's necessary, I do it. If it is your will, yeah. yeah. Well, I, is it bargaining? 
I mean, he's, it's, he's saying, I don't like this, but if it has to happen, I accept it. I mean, there's a, there's a... Three times. Yes. Okay. Well, you can say that. But then the, th the fourth stage is uh, conventionally seen as depression. And that usually is accompanied by, there's nothing I can do about this, I feel hopeless, uh, and we are confronted by the regrets of our past, the things we've done wrong, the failures, and there's nothing we can do about this now, there's no hope. Did Jesus experience, do we see Jesus experiencing depression in this way? No. I don't think so. In fact, if anything, he seems to be uh, to expand uh, the closer he comes and goes through. These are he, he actually goes through what would be these stages. If the ego, if he was still in the orbit of the ego, and this is not I'm not saying these are sins or culpable. This is just human uh, the human condition, but. Uh, as, he, as he comes to what would be these stages in us, or the vast majority of people, uh, he, he doesn't get hooked on them, he doesn't get stuck on them. So, and then the final uh, phase, which uh, it's hoped uh, we get to uh, through this, these stages of grief and dying, is uh, acceptance. And with that comes a calmness, a peacefulness. Uh, does he, did he find this? So he seems to have gone right through, sped through these stages uh, very quickly, if, uh, without actually being hooked by them, but went through them. These were the moments he could have gone through and got stuck at, uh, but came to this acceptance. Um, in the... Uh, different spiritual traditions and you see this I think four or five times it's mentioned in the uh, book of Revelation uh, this, uh, this uh, term the second death and the second death uh, can be variously described but usually it's associated with with a um, either it, you know um, with with uh, a, a total and irreversible hopelessness. And what we would all, what we would call hell, what we would all fear most. And the message of the, uh, of the New Testament uh, vision of the Christian hope is that if we can die the first death, which is the death of the ego, we have nothing to fear in the second death. And I think we could say this expresses itself in what many people would, would say is one of the fruits of meditation is that your our natural fear of death, anxiety about death and separation and loss and so on, uh, diminishes. It's not to say we wouldn't be thrown into a panic if we were told we, we had a, a month to live but, uh, at first. But as you'll see in, uh, if you watch that amazing uh, conversation with Patricia Ng, which is on YouTube, From Panic to Peace, she describes how her faith and her meditation and her beloved family, all of that, uh, but she attributed a great deal of it to meditation, to making it possible, helped her to go from the panic when she was diagnosed with uh, stage four cancer and given three months to live, uh, and how this led her after 19 months of medical treatment to um, to, to to uh, from panic to peace. And it brought her to the point where she said she was quite radiant and joyful as she said it. Actually, these last 19 months or so have been pretty 
terrible in many ways. And of course, I don't want to leave my, my husband and my family. However, I have learned so much in this time that I would happily go through it all again. So, if we can, if we can be, at least begin to practice the first death, the transcendence, boosting ourselves out of the orbit of the ego, we will find that we won't be so frightened of that, uh, of the second death. The other uh, way of understanding death in the New Testament is um, sin. In other words, when we are trapped uh, in the orbit of the ego and just revolving around and around and around again the same old things, when we're stuck. This is what the ego does, it gets us stuck. And um, the message uh, that comes through in all the different phases of the teaching is that he loved us even when we were dead in our sins. So even when we were at our most hopeless, we were loved. So this is the energy that boosts the rocket off the launch pad and out into space and the, and the exploration of new life and new civilizations. This is the, this is the energy where it, that it comes from. And so we can see the cross not simply as a dark uh, expression of, uh, of suffering. That was inevitable because of the, because of the way he, he, he was going to be rejected. Um, but we can see the cross, above all, as an expression of love. And what meditation teaches us is that love is the work of deep attention, deep selfless attention. So when we come to venerate the cross or when we spend some time maybe today quietly looking at the cross, I think it, we should be able to see and feel the silence of the cross and attention is the work of silence. Attention is love. So we can look at the cross, experience the cross, as this loving attention of God to us, even in our most hopeless moment. What seems to be our most hopeless moment, the death of hopes. Okay, but actually, a huge amount of energy is being transmitted uh, through that um, through the cross. It's not the end. It's not the final frontier. And that's what we will come to see tomorrow and, and Sunday. But, but this explains the, this, this paradox, and which was very shocking and mysterious to, the, um, to their contemporaries. This explains why the early Christians were able to, as it were, rejoice in the cross. But I think we have, to, we have to come to understand what that means through some quite hard truths. This is um, what the letter to the Philippians says. And I'll just go back, we'll rewind it a little bit because um, it's, it's Paul, or the figure of Paul, speaking about um, how he was changed. So he, he began as a Taliban. He was a total fundamentalist. He would have, be, he would have gone around destroying Buddhist uh, uh, statues and he would have, uh, and, he, as he, and he did persecute the first Jewish Christians. So I was born of the race of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrew parents. I was a Pharisee. And as for religious fervor, I was a persecutor of the church. As for the uprightness embodied in the law, I was faultless. 
So, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't, he couldn't have started from further back. <laughs> but what were once my assets, so this is where it was, it was those qualities, his pride in his race, in his religion, in his tradition, his um, uh, arrogant sense of superiority, and uh, the ability and the right uh, to dominate or persecute those who were different. So those, those were his, that was the basis of his meaning in life. That's what gave him his sense of purpose and hope. But what were once my assets, I now, through Christ Jesus, count as losses. So a radical inversion of his value system. Yes, I will go further. There's a new frontier to this understanding. Because of the supreme advantage of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, I count everything else as loss. For him, I have accepted the loss of all other things and look on them all as garbage. If only I can gain Christ and be given a place in him. All, I, all he desires is to, um, as he goes on to say, uh, and, and here is a sense of, of the adventure of the Star, uh, Star Trek uh, exploration. Not that I've secured it already, I haven't re reached my goal, but I'm still pursuing it in the hope, in the attempt to take hold of the prize for which Christ once took hold of me. Brothers, I do not reckon myself, myself as having taken hold of it. I can only say that forgetting all that lies behind me, and straining forward to what lies ahead, I am racing towards the finishing point to win the prize of God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. So this is the way in which all of us who are mature should be thinking. And if you are still thinking differently in any way, then God has yet to make this matter clear to you. So <laughs> you don't understand it yet. Meanwhile, let us go forward from the point we have each attained. So here is, this is Christian hope. And it's a hope that begins with the death of hopes. Because this point from which you can say, I'm leaving everything else behind me, has to be a, a moment of death. So the cross has this finality to it. But it's because it has this finality, what is finalized? What is what is ended in this death. It's the orbit of the ego and our enslavement to our desires and to our fantasies and to our false hopes. That's ended, that is what dies. And we're boosted out into the, <coughs> into the wonder of existence. And that's why we can say it was a good death and why we call this Friday good. So maybe we could just end uh, with these uh, words from T.S. Eliot from Little Gidding. So the essence of uh, a Christian understanding of the cross is to see it as an explosion of love, not as a celebration of, uh, of death or a celebration of uh, suffering. And certainly th we should not, uh, if we still think that this means you can only come to God through suffering and that, and that suffering is the supreme way, then as St. Paul says, you should think again. So, uh, paradoxically and yet very f richly, 
The cross is the symbol of love and hope. So this is how um, G.S. Eliot uh, ends his great work, uh, The Four Quartets. With the drawing of this love and the voice of this calling, we shall not cease from exploration. And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. The end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and to know the place for the first time. This is why he says in another passage, what we call the beginning is often the end. And to make an end is to make a beginning. The end is where we start from. And then uh, he describes, I hope some of these images you may pick up as you walk around the island today in this beautiful sunshine. Uh, he ends with this uh, succession of, of images uh, of ordinary things, natural things, that reveal this. That's how we began looking at um, Seamus Heaney's uh, discovery of the, the meaning and the, um, and the grace and the depth in very simple things. So the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time through the unknown, remembered gate, when the last of earth left to discover is that which was the beginning. At the source of the longest river, the voice of the hidden waterfall, and the children in the apple tree, not known because not looked for, but heard, half heard, in the stillness between two waves of the sea. Quick, now, here, now, always. A condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than everything. It's a phrase from Julian of Norwich describing prayer. And uh, it's certainly a way we can understand meditation and also the cross. A condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than everything. And all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, when the tongues of flame are infolded into the crowned knot of fire, and the fire and the rose are one. So the fire is usually seen as a mystical symbol, the divine, a symbol of div divine experience, divine energy. And the rose is seen as a symbol of, of earthly delights, of, of you know, the, the beauty and the, the delights of, the, of creation, of the material world. So let's listen to that again. And all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, when the tongues of flame are infolded into the crowned knot of fire, and the fire and the rose are one. Good. So we could take a, a few minutes if anyone would like to share any uh, reflections or raise any questions. Uh, Tom.
think that for the sheep, um, why does Jesus say one hour? Can you not hear people say wait for one hour? Is there any specific meaning? And he does uh, ask it three times. Mm. Could you elaborate a little bit more? Um, I can't remember the uh, text of the Greek text that, uh, but I would I would think uh, maybe somebody online will uh, have a better answer. But I think it would just refer me an hour is is, is the hour for is the time for an appointment, isn't it? Normally, of course, you know, uh, if you have making an appointment. Appointment, you, you allow an hour for it. And this is very inefficient. So I think it's a, it's a time of, of that is not too long and not too short. Um, you can give an hour without giving the whole day or your whole life. So it's a small, a relatively small gift of, of time and of self, of attention, and. Uh, And I think their failure, because of the weakness of the flesh, to do that. Um, what does it suggest? I mean, it suggests they were very tired, but also, I think when we uh, when we face uh, intense emotional uh, stress um, or grief or fear, uh, that can be. The way we respond to it is, is just to shut down, just to go unconscious, just to just to sleep. And an hour, you know, it's like uh, we say half an hour for med for meditation, and that's the traditional wisdom, really, uh, for many uh, traditions in the Western tradition, especially, uh, because uh, uh, half hour is long enough for you to, to get into it, to get into your stride, and to begin to lay aside your thoughts, and maybe you, know, you're not, you don't have a stopwatch uh, timing yourself, but you may have a very short period of, of relatively pure attention or concentration during the meditation. So you, but you need, you need that other time to do the work to bring you to that stillness, relative stillness. You know, so, um, on the other hand, if you if you stay meditating too long, uh, it's difficult to maintain that uh, clarity and uh, uh, momentum of attention. And so your mind very easily begins to wobble. And even if you don't start daydreaming or fall asleep, you can just uh, you just go into a sort of a half comatose state. So a half hour is a, is, a, is a conventional time to allow you to do this work and do it well and maintain the quality of it. And so you can say Benedict says, you know, keep your prayer frequent but short because otherwise you can go into a sleepy state. Could you perhaps say that staying away? One hour a day, uh, meditating twice a day. Mm. Yes, okay. <laughs> yes, that's, 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 that's true. We do two, two half hours, yes. That's right, yes. But it says in the, the book of Revelation when the seventh seal was opened, there was silence in heaven for the space of half an hour. So I tell the fundamentalists to say meditation is not Christian, but. Uh, <laughs> I've been meditating heaven for half an hour. You talked about the psychological states of dying. Um, I have family members who have been suffered to sudden death. I mean, could you mm. have some thoughts on that? Because it seems to me that in this world we live in, people couldn't be taken from these yes. straight things like that. Yes. That's very, it's true. I mean, that, you know, a sudden death sets up a whole range of, of, uh, of, of um, problems and uh, turbulence um, that you have to deal with after the event. Ideally, 
and this was how death was seen uh, in the past in traditional societies. Death was something you prepared for, and many, you know, in many cases, people would know that their time had come, as Jesus said. They knew their time was come. And to say Jesus so prepared for his death. That they knew their time had come, and they would take to their bed. Mm. And uh, there are many examples of that from the literature. Philip Arias, who did this great study of, uh, of death and dying in Western medieval or well, Western culture, uh, gives many examples of that <coughs> uh, from village life. You know, people say, "Well, that's it. I'm, I'm dying now." So they they take to their bed, and everybody says, "Oh, they're dying," and then everybody comes to see them. And uh, and it seemed to have been whereas death for us is, is you know it feels like exclusion, you know, isolation, and so on, and very lonely thing. Um, in other cultures, it was seen as something in which the local community, as well as the family, would participate. So the word would go out. But he's dying, he's, he's about to die, so everyone in the village would run, would run into the room to be there. Uh, anyway, there are examples of that happening. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think uh, the idea of preparing for death and, and being supported by not only the immediate love of your family, but also by the community, it's, uh, it's very foreign to our uh, concept of death. Um, you know, in intensive care or where maybe the people around you are doing everything they can to extend your life by a few minutes or a few days. So, but the, the idea of, of a, a death for which you're not prepared, a sudden tragic accident or sudden death, yeah. is, um, I think the, I think it, I think the, uh, the passage you have to go through and the way you have to deal with it are the same, but it's uh, in retrospect. Yes. Yes. I suppose it could be said that this work of meditation is a preparation for the possibility of yes. in this world like that. Yes. And that's a good justification for it. Yes. Yes, I met an old monk once uh, who was talking with him about death and. Um, he said, uh, I'm very curious. <laughs> and, and he was genuine. Uh, I, I think he was genuine. You know, we, he said that we, we should have a holy curiosity about death. <laughs> so, and I think it, it's easier to uh, accept that uh, <coughs> it wasn't with him when he died, so I don't know whether he was feeling that right up to the end. But, uh, but I think you, you, you can have that sense of, um, of openness, of curiosity, of acceptance, uh, and I mean not only acceptance, but also the sort of sense of anticipation, uh, if you're prepared, you know, and if you've, if you've got a, um, a context in which you can find meaning in that. The problem is, if you don't have any context for meaning, it's, oh, it could be just overwhelmingly horrifying and then, then you have to just you get stuck in the state of denial. Mm -hmm. There is a question from David. Father Lawrence, when we meditate and go beyond the ego and die the first death for a while, what is that is resurrected in a personal way, if anything? How does the, re the resurrection bring back something which is not ego? Christ wasn't recognized when he returned. Thank you for your thoughts. Mm. Well, if you take this uh, image of, uh, of, the, of, this, of the Star Trek uh, Enterprise spaceship um, being boosted out of the orbit of the gravitational pull of the Earth and into the great expanding universe that we inhabit. Let's just, just take that as an image. I think that is a way we can see the resurrection. Uh, the death process is the 
is the is the moving beyond that orbit, breaking this gravitational pull, which is both thrilling but also frightening, because <coughs> we like to stay home and we like to revolve around our gravitational center, we like things to be familiar, uh, e easier to watch uh, Star Trek than it is to actually get into a spaceship and, and go. How many people would actually take that opportunity? There's a very good uh, film on this line called Mission to Mars, in which at the end of the film, they've discovered this uh, alien race, that is a friendly alien race, uh, who have actually created the human race. And um, these nice uh, aliens uh, offer them, offer the people an opportunity, the, the spaceship crew, an opportunity to go with them back to their what, what was their to their home to where actually the human race began and uh, now that they are ready you know they, we've evolved enough to be able to understand where we come from and to really ex expand our understanding and, and he shows them the whole cosmos and where we really belong. Um, and so he says, you can come, you know, they say, you can come with me if you like. But only, only one of them does. And he's, he's the one, actually, who had lost his wife at the beginning of the film, uh, who had experienced death, and maybe you might say he had nothing, nothing else to lose. But, so he, he was... Uh, he went, the others weren't ready yet, so they went home and wrote books about it. Uh, so, but actually in his, uh, in, in, when he's being transported, you see the one who, 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 who took up the invitation to go when no one has gone before. Uh, he's put into this capsule, it's a bit like a coffin, a stand-up coffin, and he has to be, he has to be, um, you know, re re reformatted uh, to be able to move into this new world, this new universe. And so he's put into this uh, tube, and then he's just waiting to see what's going to happen, and then he gets a bit scared because the tube begins to fill up with some kind of liquid. And uh, he uh, is then, you think he's going to drown, and he, you can see he's frightened of drowning in this liquid. But then, even when he's covered, uh, he can breathe. And so he's now ready for the, for the journey. Um, he didn't make the second part of the film yet. <laughs> um, but, uh, so I, I, I remember that when I was, um, my one occasion where I learned to dive in. And it's quite frightening to dive for the first time. Um, and the instructor helped me understand it a lot. He said, really, it's all quite simple. You just have to believe that you can breathe underwater. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true, provided you've got your oxygen <laughs> thing. You can breathe underwater, and it's a huge, it's, it, once you believe it and you experience it, it's no problem. Then you, there are a few technicalities you have to learn. But that's the big leap. So I think, you know, those are images uh, that help us maybe to understand what resurrection means. And um, there is a transformation, as a, we are reformatted, but there is a continuity in identity as well. Okay, let's, uh, let's take a brief pause and uh, then we'll come to meditate and we'll meet in the church. Uh, try, try to get to the church a little early. Um, we start at 3 o'clock.
moving, in your posture, upright, alert, feet on the ground if you're sitting in the chairs, relax your shoulders, and take a couple of deep breaths just to refresh and renew yourself. Lightly. Try to sit as still as you can. The stillness of the body will help to still the mind. But we come to the stillness by laying aside all the mobility of our thoughts and desires and hopes. Not denying them, but just laying them aside, and giving our whole self to this simple work of attention. And to do